Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. So um, after we will finish with all these wonderful TED Talks, uh, we may still feel energetic, and we may decide actually to go to a bar. Now, while you're in a bar, uh, you may actually decide to play a game of darts. And while you're playing this game of darts, you may realize that you cannot always hit bullseye. If you will, please let me know, and I will be your manager. <laughs> and we can make some really good monies together, okay? But you're not gonna be always be able to hit bullseye. And guess what? Even professional dart thrower cannot do so. And this actually can extend to other, actually, sports as well, too. Let's, for example, take basketball. Even the best basketball players cannot hit 100% of their free throws. But if we will take this down to very fundamental tasks, let's say, for example, walking. In terms of walking, you are actually like LeBron James. You've practiced walking for years and years and years and years. But guess what? If you will actually see your steps behind you on the snow, they're never exactly the same. This is what we call, actually, in movement, repetition without repetition. And this variation in terms of movement is a fact of life. Now, people for years believed, actually, that this variability is just simply noise in the system, that we want to get rid of it. So it's kind of like when you drive to work and you're trying to listen to the beautiful crystal, vo crystal voice of Lady Gaga. <laughs> and you mess, around with the, you mess around with the dial a little bit to just get rid of that noise over her voice, actually, so her crystal voice can come out. Okay. So that's what you're trying to do. Well, people actually thought that variability is exactly the same. If somehow I can get rid of it, I'll be perfect. I'll be a perfect dart thrower. I will be a perfect basketball player. But how can that be possible, as we mentioned earlier? If variability is actually a fact for life, this doesn't make, even make sense. So it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to me that this variability is just simply bad for you. It seems actually illogical. It seems actually imp impractical. So what I thought I should do, I thought I will challenge this, actually. I thought I will challenge this idea. And my idea was that variability will be actually something that will be useful, something that should be embraced. But what I needed to do in order for me to prove my idea was to put movement under the microscope. Now, the same way that long time ago they put blood under the microscope and they saw all kind of amazing things that our eyes cannot see, the same thing holds true with movement. You see, our eyes can only see only 10 to 12 pictures per second. The instrumentation that we have in biomechanics can actually see hundreds or even thousands of pictures per second. And in this fashion, I can see the variations from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So I started walking on a treadmill. I started walking, for example, <laughs> over ground. But also, we looked at all kind of like other situations in terms of this very simple and fundamental task. For example, like what happens when you walk in the forest <laughs> in a virtual reality type of environment. Uh, also, for example, we look at how young kids walk, how older individuals actually walk, how people actually, who they have pathologists actually walk. We look at all kind of different situations. We look also at other simple tasks as well, too. How about standing? There is variability in standing as well, too. You cannot stand perfectly still. You actually, if you will close your eyes, you sway even more. You see the sway variability actually there. Uh, so now, when we put actually variability under the microscope, what we were actually able to see? All kind of like very, very interesting things. First of all, we're actually able to see that small pieces of the data, small, small pieces of movement variations over time, they look like very, very similar with a bigger piece of the data. This is like very, very similar with the Sierpinski triangle. You take a smaller piece of the triangle, and it looks very, very similar, almost exactly the same, with a bigger one. Now, and it, th this was not the only thing that we're actually able to see. When we looked at these variations closely, we're actually able to see that there were like few big movements, bunch of actually many medium-sized movements, and a huge number 
of a very, very small size movements as well, too. So there was like a very interesting distribution as well there. Now, such patterns actually exist everywhere. We see them actually in nature, in terms of trees, in terms of clouds, in terms of lighting. We also see them inside of us. We see them in the lungs, we see them in the intestines, we see them in the cardiovascular system. And, and again, what we mean by that, we see like few big branches, and many medium-sized branches, and a huge number of small-sized branches. So we are part of nature, and nature does not work in imperfection. It is in our imperfection that we are actually beautiful and perfect. Now, we also very much like such patterns as well, too. When we listen to music, for example, we don't like music which is monotonous. We like music that actually has that type of a distribution, that doesn't even have like huge changes as well too. And we see this in all kind of like other things as well too. Now, through our work also, we're actually able to find out what's going on with pathology. Pathology actually destroys those patterns and can make you actually one of two things. One can, also, can make you very, very rigid, like a robot. Danger, 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 danger. I'm a robot, okay? <laughs> now, if you're very robotic, what happens actually, you lose this adaptability. Your variations over time, they're exactly the same, and you lose your ability to be adaptable to different terrains. And we see that with knee injuries. Now, also, pathology can also make you kind of like being all over the place, like a frail older adult who kind of like is very unbalanced. The same thing, however, could happen because of the effect of other things. We have the phenomena of the drunken scientist, like me. If I have one too many, for example, I'm kind of like, like that too, okay? I'm kind of like all over the place as well too, okay? Many big movements, okay? So, in other words, what is actually health? Health, what we found out about health, is actually a state where you actually have these complex but beautiful patterns. If you will lose this on one side, you can be very, very rigid like a robot, or you can actually like be very, very noisy and kind of like all over the place, like the frail older adult. And through our modeling work, we're actually able to identify that when you're rigid like that, or when you're actually all over the place, if we will actually push the model just with a small force, it will fall. But when you actually exhibit these complex and beautiful patterns, you can withstand, actually, even much, much larger force in terms of a fall. Now, this reminds me a lot something that actually Schrodinger, and you might know Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, this famous experiment, who actually said in 1994, said something very, very similar. Life is an aperiodic crystal. It's not random and it's not periodic. It is something in between. So I believe that variability could actually be the spice of life. Now, one thought that may be brewing in your mind right now, it is, Nick, if something happens to me, can, is there any way that I can get these healthy patterns back? Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, we've been studying this for years and years and years, actually. So I'll give you like three different types of experimental work that we've done that actually says, the, that the answer to this is actually yes. First of all, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about our virtual reality work. So if you will actually put a weight on one side of an individual, you give him a limp. If there is a big weight, you give him a limp. Okay? And you see this in these two graphs up there, actually, in these two figures. This is depicted, actually, on one, the one side is depicted with these red dots, and the other side is depicted with the green dots. And um, they're kind of like far away from each other on the left side type of a, of a graph where you actually like see 200 steps over time and you see actually the time that they spend on the ground. But what if I tell you that then we're exposed into virtual reality, these dots, they came together as you see here in the data, okay? So practically vision overrode the sensation of the weight and you actually achieve, again, symmetry. And not only you achieve, again, symmetry, you achieve, actually, this healthy pattern I was talking to you earlier. How about that? That is actually truly a novel and serendipitous result. And this actually led us to now experiment with goggles where we actually incorporate 
virtual reality environments that you walk on them, but they vary over time based on these healthy patterns that I talked to you earlier. And we can do all kind of like very interesting things actually with this virtual reality environment, and you can pick the one that you like. In addition to this, we are exploring actually haptic information, vibratory devices, where they can vibrate based actually on these patterns that I mentioned to you earlier. And we are doing this work right now with amputees. Now, another body of work that we did is with babies. Now, with babies, actually, we focused on babies because, again, we have this variability problem over there in terms of sway variability in sitting. I mentioned to you earlier about standing, but what about sitting as well, too? When we have a baby that has actually motor delays early in life and cannot actually accomplish the skill of sitting, we see that they actually don't have these healthy patterns in their sway. They kind of like all over the place or they are very, very rigid. So what we thought is like we thought about developing an intervention that will actually help these babies achieve the sitting posture on time. Why? Because if you don't achieve it on time, that will translate to problems actually later in life in terms of standing, watching, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of babies, where they had a motor delay that they make them very, very rigid and hypotonic and static, we actually provided environmental adaptations that will actually try to push them out of this, uh, out of this static type of a situation and will enhance variability. When we had actually like babies who they were kind of like all over the place expressed with movements like back and forth like this, we provided soft constraints that allow them actually to discover in between these soft constraints. So here are some results. So in this video, we see actually a child that has a very, very hard time sitting. You see how difficult it is for this child to sit. It continuously falls. As soon as you let it go, it will fall. What about if you will see the same child a couple of months later after was being exposed in our intervention? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Well, if I'll go to heaven, it's going to be because of things like that. <laughs> okay. So this is a tremendous result, actually, a tremendous result. And what if I tell you that actually our intervention does better than the standard care of treatment. Now, this intervention has been published, and it's available for physical therapists to use. Now, the last piece of experimental work that I want to speak to you about is I want to speak to you a little bit about the work that we did with alders who they are susceptible to falls. What we did with them, we actually took music that uh, we slowed it down or we speed it up, and based on the speed of the individual. And then what we did, we took the notes and we incorporated variability into the notes, okay? We made actually the notes uh, either coming faster or slower, but in between the notes actually, we changed the distance between the notes based on these healthy patterns that I mentioned to you earlier. And then we had actually the older adults step on this. Now, let me play some music to you just to see exactly what I mean with that. I'm going to be your TJ for a little bit, OK? <laughs> All right? Now, here, the notes always come with the same distance. Time distance, that is. And of course, you recognize few release. Now. Now, you see here the variations. Sometimes they go slower, sometimes they go faster and stuff like that. This is actually based on these healthy patterns that I mentioned to you earlier. So now imagine that we have an older adult who is susceptible to falls, but practices actually uh, on this music, stepping on this rhythm actually in the comfort of their house based on whatever music that they like to, okay? Not just few release, maybe Lady Gaga. Okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, with all this in mind, actually, what is my problems now? My problems now is actually how to actually help these people, how to translate my research to help these people right at home. So, for example, for the older adults, 
how to translate actually this music so, I can, so older adults can use it in their, in their homes. And also the other things that I mentioned to you, like the goggles, for example, how we can translate those things for older adults also, who they have like maybe an asymmetry can use in their homes. But also how to extend this research uh, in other pathologies. So let's say, for example, with amputees, with individuals who they have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, who they have stroke, who they have Parkinson. And not only that, now that you know this information, what is your problems? Uh, well, how can you actually, if you will think about it, the question will be like, how can you maintain your healthy patterns? Um, well, I suggest to you variable training, <laughs> okay? And what do we mean with this variable training? Well, first of all, let's take this distribution that I mentioned to you earlier. So, uh, and for an example, let's say that you're lifting. Well, incorporate that distribution in your lifting. Maybe you can have like few large lifts, many medium-sized lifts, and a huge number of small lifts. Uh, or, for example, you can incorporate this into your diet, let's say, as well, too, because it could expand to a lot of other things. What do we mean in terms of diet? Well, maybe a couple of pieces of chocolate, <laughs> who they have like a huge amount of calories, okay? Many uh, pieces of food, who they have like some type of like a medium size of calories, and then a bunch of vegetables, who they have very little amount <laughs> in terms of calories as well, too. But uh, this actually could extend to all kind of like uh, stages in terms of your life, vi this variable train. You can incorporate variability in almost everything that you do. Consider, for example, driving to work. Take a different route every day. Incorporate variability in your life. These small changes actually could go a long way. This variability in your life could go a long way. Because as I mentioned to you, variability could be the spice of life. Thank you very much.